<gasps> Three, two, one. Hey, Internet friends, this is Magic Brad with Synergy Cafe, the Synergy Lifestyle Academy and Synergy Collaborative, and I've got my new friend, and her name is Megan, and the last name is Fettis, isn't it? Yes, you got it, man. <laughs> and you're from up north, up there in Canada. Yep, yep, in the ice block of Canada, you know. <laughs> Well, I'm in Minnesota and it's kind of cold here too, but some people think that it's like cold all the time and it's not. I mean, sometimes it gets to be a hundred and something. Same up there, I'm sure of it. <laughs> right? Yes. We do have our long, cold winters, but I mean, we also do get summer, which often people don't think we receive. Kind of interesting. I know. I did an event here as an international event and people brought coats and it was like in August when it's like 95 degrees and they... I don't know. It's not, it's not cold here. No, it's not that cold here. But we keep it cold so you, the foreigners don't come here and crowd the place, right? That's what keeps them out. Totally. We're the same, right? We got to make sure that six months of the year, we're just the locals. <laughs> it doesn't get too crowded. Yeah, I got a martial arts background. We used to do tournaments up in Duluth, which is by Lake Superior. And the, a lot of the Canadians oh, would come yeah. down. Canadians and come down for the tournaments and boy, you guys know how to party. Crazy. <laughs> that's what, that's what they say as crazy Canucks, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so are you married and got kids and all that? Can we have a I am. <laughs> I've got two young boys. They're busy, but they're awesome. So much fun. And yeah, married with my husband. How long have you lived where you live? I have always lived here. See, and you know, that's the other funny thing that I find with Canadians and Americans. I find Americans, you guys move around a lot. Whereas Canadians, we tend to be a little bit more, once we are in a location, we stay there. We're almost like trees. We don't move too much. Well, it must have something to do with the colder weather because um, I lived in the same house for 53 years before I got married. <laughs> wow. Well, and you know, and we actually live on the same property that I grew up on. So pretty much it's very similar. Deep roots for the homestead. And then you get to travel all over the place. And I'm sure you've done some of that because you're also a yoga person, right? I saw some of that. Yeah. Yeah. I used to teach yoga for the last 15 years and love traveling. I think that's one of the reasons why I like to have those roots in the home base is because then it gives me more of an opportunity to just go and explore everything else that there is in the world. And there's a lot. There's a lot of things to do. So what is it that you're focusing on now in your life? Well, my focus is all on supporting holistic entrepreneurs build their business in a space of alignment with their, their spiritual beliefs, the universal laws, and really to release the, the resistance that often people generate when building their business so that they can actually support individuals that the way they want to create that impact and generate greater revenue. Do you find that some of that, um, the issue with like the holistic type people, because that niche of people, they want to help people. So do you find a lot of times they don't want to charge too much because, you know, the scarcity consciousness kind of thing? They don't want to charge? Absolutely. There's, it's quite interesting talking because there's this idea out there that making money isn't spiritual. But when we break it down, money is energy, right? And yep. what else is more spiritual than connecting to that abundance energy and allowing that, that fluidity to come in? Exactly. That's just a mindset thing. If people realize that money is just a method of measuring an exchange, that's all it really is. So it's just energy flowing. If someone knows how to like dig a basement for a house and they exchange money so they can go to the grocery store and buy eggs, that's all it really is. It's just, just a flow. So that's why I call it currency. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I like that. I've never actually thought about it that way, but that is a great way to put it. That's my magic mind. I think different. <laughs> mm. Well, now that's going to be stuck in my mind forever. So I appreciate that one. 
Well, I, I find a lot of things have this little parallel kind of things going over. Like when you get into the, um, if you're familiar with the Abraham Hicks things, there's the vortex and it's a matter of going into another mm -hmm. vortex and the concept of the universe, which means one. Some people talk about multiple universes. That can't be, there's only one. So we're all in the same universe and it ends up being the observer, whether they're observing a wave or a particle. And it'll change mm -hmm. every time you view it, depending on how you're looking at it, you know? So all that stuff, you can just kind of shift that thinking and all of a sudden, poof, money turns into currency and now you let it flow. Because you don't want to hang on to your money. You want to take it in and spend it. <laughs> Absolutely. And it's all about the energy that we put into it, right? Like mm -hmm. often people, I think, feel nervous or create that scarcity belief system because they don't want to feel greedy. They don't want to create that negative energy around money when they don't realize that we are the ones controlling that frequency, not money itself. Money is simply energy. It has no ability to shift its frequency, but we do. Yeah, like I said, it's just like, like it's pieces of paper and now it's just digital stuff. It's just a bunch of little, bunch of ones and zeros flowing through the internet these days. <laughs> yeah. Right? So you can pick and decide whether it's a one or a zero or both or a combination of all three. Totally. <laughs> yep. And you know, it's interesting, like when it comes to money, like I grew up with a grandmother who lived very much from the law of abundance. Like she never worked a day in my life yet, never worried about money. She always had more than enough. And I remember being a teenager and asking her like, how? Because I watched my parents work so hard for just enough. But then on the other side of the spectrum, my grandma didn't work and had more than enough. And what she said to me when I was a teenager, when I asked her, it was so matter of a fact to her. She was like, well, you just have to get clear on what you need and you have to ask for it from the universe. And then you need to let it go and trust that that's going to come into your account. And that was her belief system. And every single month, that's what happened. But she didn't worry about it. She didn't fear it. She didn't withhold her spending. She was like the most abundant, trusting, faith-driven woman I've ever met in my life. And now there's you. <laughs> now there's me, <laughs> yep. So when you're talking with people like this, it's, it's a challenge I'm assuming to get that across to people because a lot of uh, ways that they teach people how to build businesses is put together a business plan. And some people think that that is a like the exact roadmap for how you have to do everything. But if you look back on it and you got your three year or five year plan, if you were to look back on it, on how you got to where you got, I'll bet it didn't go that way. It's usually, you know. And that's just it. I think when we create a business plan, it kind of pigeonholes us into what we think it should be. And when right. we get stuck in all of those shoulds, we create all of that resistance right? Because then we're not allowing our vision to be broad in seeing what's actually happening around us, what opportunities are coming our way that are actually meant for us versus what we perceived when we did that plan. So yeah. I always say to my clients, it's important to have an idea, those, those plans of what you want to create in year, three years, five years, but then allow, like have space for allowing as well sure you never know where it's going to come from like you could like i'm in a meditation and i'm thinking about i want to attract some money because i want to raise the funds to go on a trip or whatever it doesn't matter where it's coming from and then all of a sudden i go to lunch with my family and my brother says hey by the way here's that 1500 bucks oh yeah where did that come from but yeah. if you would have planned it out it wouldn't work that way Yep. And the biggest thing is trust, right? Because often when we get into that plan, we, we start, that word hustle comes in, right? Oh, well, I've got to hustle. I've got to do all of these things. But we forget that the actual doing is part of the inner work, not necessarily all of the outer work. It's aligning ourselves, our energy, our mindset with what it is that we want to create in our lives, what we choose to create versus feeling like we need to push really hard. You know, that being said, it's, it's interesting how this stuff really is really, really, really simple and how it can, we, our brains will just make it complicated. 
like the, the simplicity of it, it's like a three-stage thing. You plant the seed, nurture the plant, harvest the fruit. That's all it really is. <laughs> so you plant the seed of thought, get crystal clear with it, whether you were growing an apple tree or an orange tree or a rose bush, know exactly what you're growing, and then take care of it. It pops out of the ground and poof, you got apples, right? But it's got to, you got to focus. Mm -hmm. and it's so easy to kind of get distracted and start thinking, oh my God, like you said, you got a busy work. I, I got to go do this. I got to make some phone calls. I got it. Maybe you don't. That's just it. Like clarity is the most essential piece, right? When you plant that seed, what's the clarity? And then create the space for it as well, because no plant can really flourish when there's no space for it. Yeah, like um, so, farmers don't, when they plant their corn, they don't go and check to see if it's sprouting roots and everything. They just kind of let it go until it comes up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. And I always go back to like nature being our best teacher, our best guide, because universal laws navigate on all realms for vegetation, for animals, for ourselves. And when we're, we're starting, because often this is, I find, what shifts people in that focal point is they expect results right away. And they forget that there's often a 90-day incubation period, right? When we sure. think about a seed, it doesn't start to, to sprout. It starts doing everything underground first that we can't see. But we don't actually see anything come up for a few days, a few weeks even. And then we can't actually harvest that seed, what it renders, for at least about 90 days. And so the same goes for us and all of the work that we do. We need to give it space for it to actually come up and fulfill its purpose. Do you find in your teaching and working with your clients that you spend a lot of time um, unlearning for them? Oh, <laughs> yes. You know, have you ever heard the quote? This is one of my favorite quotes. And I'm probably not going to say it correctly. I kind of go within the guidelines of it. But um, it's the idea that the sculptor, when creating the piece of art, doesn't add anything to the piece of material that he's there working with. They're actually taking away everything that isn't part of the sculpture. And so same goes with us. Like it's what can we do to take away all of those ideas or beliefs or patterns or habits that are actually clouding that true beauty that resides within. And that it comes back into where the clarity is so important. You gotta be real clear what's inside of that granite. Yes. Yeah, and take the space, right? The time to, to feel it and experience it so that we're not rushing or hustling through that process so that the clarity can, can land. In addition to your coaching and working with clients, do you also do events and things like that? Like retreats and workshops? And Yes. Yeah, I do a lot of retreats and a lot of workshops. Obviously, a little bit different right now. But um, that's one of my favorite things because I love getting together in groups. Um, I find the energy in group settings is incredible because you can shift energy and mindset a lot faster in a group setting from that listening and that vulnerability space. And also it gives us a great opportunity to explore and experience other things in the world as well. It's a lot of fun. Where do you do your events? Any exotic places? And I'm, I'm, I got one on my mind, see if you name it. Mm. Well, I've done them down in Costa Rica and Hawaii was Costa Rica. <laughs> yeah, I'm, work, I'm working on a project down there with an event center. <laughs> oh beautiful have you been down there it is amazing Just one of my once. favorite places in the world i've only been down there once and i got a friend that has 150 acres down there and we're looking to build an event center in the jungle amazing well let me know because okay, i would love to hear more about that where else have you been um for workshops and events we did one in hawaii We've done nothing in Bali yet. That's the next one. That's the that second like place to. I was going to say. I've been to Bali twice. Yes, that's it's my favorite place. Oh, in the have you? I've never been there yet, and I'm so Bali excited. Bali is to check the, it out. it's the most peaceful place you'll ever be. I've been to Thailand. I've been to. I've been to 
to uh, Jamaica, I've been to uh, Costa Rica, I've been to Brazil, I've been to uh, Amsterdam. <laughs> but wow. Bali is the most peaceful place I've ever been. That's amazing. Yeah, I definitely want to check out Bali because it's, I've heard that from so many people that have gone and the energy and the, the rituals and everything that they do is very, very embedded in that culture. So I'm really excited to check that place out. They're always very conscious. I remember I had a real bizarre out of body experience. I was there and there was this guy, he's a shaman over there and we've met this girl and we we're gonna go out to dinner and we we're just talking. And I was talking with her while the other couple was getting ready. And all of a sudden we were like gone somewhere. I have no idea what happened, but it was like, I wasn't doing any drugs or anything like that, but it was like, I was like out of body. We were floating around. We, we didn't have any form and it wasn't really an mm -hmm. orb or anything like that. It was just two pieces of consciousness going who knows where. And I was going like, where are we going? And she says, we're not going anywhere. And I said, when are we going back? And she goes, whenever you want to. <laughs> it's just really, really weird. Such a <laughs> experience i can't really explain it because there's no, no there's no physical dimension to it it's really weird it's neat actually like those those conscious journeys right that we can go on and again and it's just shifting that the mindset into understanding that because we are many forms all wrapped into one we have the ability to do those conscious travels outside of our physical body yeah this was totally out of my control i just slipped out <laughs> <laughs> well and so it's kind of interesting because if we oh yeah go ahead what's interesting oh i was gonna say it's kind of interesting because we often go on those conscious journeys without really being aware of it sometimes they're for our benefit and sometimes they're just old patterns that keep us kind of stuck as well like if we think about like traumas or different things like that sometimes that pulls the consciousness out of the physical body in a way of like protection as well. So it can go either way. And ideally it's created there to open up the mind again in that space of being able to understand or see things from a different perspective. Yeah, or no perspective and still being able to see. <laughs> <laughs> Megan, I don't like to do these too long for people because I like them to be able to consume them and then find out who you are and how to get a hold of you. So let's go into that. Is there something that you have to offer? Do you have a book or uh, like an ebook or something people can register for? And then how do they how do they get a hold of you if they want to take this to another level? Absolutely, yes, I do have an ebook that is all about how to align your energy within the twelve universal laws and your business, creating the clarity within what it is that you want to build within your business, so that you are able to drop the resistance and flourish. Um, if they want a copy of that, they can either email me, which is simply meganfettis at gmail.com, or take a look on my website, which is www.meganfettis.com. And I will put those links in the places where I propagate this out so people can just kind of get it. <laughs> Excellent. That'd be awesome. Perfecto. Well, this has been really fun. There's been a little bit of a lag on here for internet connection purposes or something, but I think it'll be okay. And um, I don't waste any time. I'll have this up in about an hour and then I'll send you a link. And if you could uh, synergize and propagate it out to your world too, we'll see what we can turn up. Excellent. I know. Well, and that's the slow Canadian internet <laughs> that's lagging, but thank you so much, Brad. This has been so much fun. Thank you. And if you got something special coming up, like when you do get to Bali or something like that, and you want to do something that kind of quantum leaps towards that, we can do some more. I'm good for it. Excellent. That would be okay, fantastic. Thank you, Megan. Thanks so much, Brad.